excited to uh, have an amazing webinar this evening. Uh, so thank you all for joining. I know I had a busy clinic day myself, and I think Justine did too. Uh, Dr. Freeman, what about you? Did you have a, a clinic day today, or is today a, a webinar preparation day? Today's a webinar prep day. <laughs> <laughs> well, we thank you for that. And uh, you know, I've had the uh, the pleasure of, uh, of uh, uh, getting a sneak peek, and I know we're all in for a great uh, interactive treat. Um, but as many of you know, when we do an event on this platform, uh, it's it's interactive, it's awesome. We are on YouTube Live right now, so we're broadcasting to the veterinary world, the world itself on YouTube. So we would love if you could type in uh, where you are logging in from around the world. We usually have literally people from, I mean, boy, almost every single country out there, um, and, and it uh, it makes us feel great to see where everyone is and what everyone is doing. So uh, we're just gonna give everyone a minute or two to log in. So again, if you could type in where you're from, say hello. Um, myself, uh, Garrett Pachtinger, I am uh, along with Justino, who we'll get to in a minute. I'm the co-founder of Eckerl and a critical care specialist. I am logging in from quite the dark now because it's nighttime, but uh, you see my window um, just outside of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Really excited to have this webinar. Justine, what about you? I am logging in from St. Paul, Minnesota, and I see uh, people from everywhere. So thank you to everyone who's logged in from Alaska to North Carolina to Ross University to everywhere to Key West. Um, so, so glad everyone's here. I am also an emergency critical care specialist and thankfully hardly ever get to suture anymore, <laughs> <laughs> which is good. You don't want me doing yeah. it. So I do it for like Chinese finger traps for E-tubes, but thankfully they don't let me touch body cavities. So I'm really excited to tune in and uh, hear, hear and learn uh, from tonight. Yeah, I always joke, you know, when uh, I'm talking to families and clients over the phone and they, you know, I, I diagnose something that's surgical and they say, are you the one that's going to do the surgery? I said, trust me, they don't let me walk around with a scalpel and that's absolutely to your benefit. I'll help before. I'll help afterwards, but you don't want me. They used to call me, so the joke is when I was a, an intern, they used to call me the vitamin suturer. Why? Because one a day. That's how long it would take me to suture. So you don't want that. Now, we will get a full a full discussion and, 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 and uh, background from Dr. Freeman. But as we're doing, Dr. Freeman, where are you logging in from today as people are logging on with us tonight? I'm in fair Cypress, Texas. It's beautiful here. <laughs> <laughs> As Justine shakes her head with, you know, I'm sure it's some like negative degree in Minnesota. And it actually, it's quite chilly here in Philadelphia. We are admittedly very jealous, um, but uh, happy for you. But um, let's uh, let's let's get into this as we're getting into our just after our 830 hour. And I think most of our people are starting to to log on. So again, I uh, want to welcome you to tonight's Vectoral webinar. Very excited to have Dr. Freeman here with us. We're going to be talking about suture techniques and case application. And I can tell you, this is awesome because I've seen the presentation, I've seen the videos and really, really excited because you're going to get an opportunity to practice and learn and to see from an expert and a specialist like Dr. Freeman. So really excited. Uh, but before we get to that, I wanted to thank our Vet Girl sponsor tonight, Ethicon, is their generous support. With their generous support, um, we were able to provide this veterinary CE, race approved CE, free to the veterinary community and the veterinary world. And my hope is that many of you on this platform, on this uh, session live tonight, were also recipients of Ethicon's generous benefit of, of sending you the suture kit or suture so you can practice on your own, which is an amazing opportunity. So, really grateful to them for not only allowing us to present this tonight, but providing many of our attendees. I mean, they sent thousands of kits out to the community. So hoping that many of you are joining us tonight, or if we know people are busy, you'll watch the on-demand session and have your kit to suture. So next time you see your Ethicon rep or reach out to them, please thank them for all that they've done to provide this opportunity for our community tonight. So thank you to Ethicon for that. If this is your first girl, first me, first vet girl webinar, what you're going to learn is that we are the tech savvy way to get your continuing education. Now, this is a small animal webinar, but certainly suture skills applies to everything. But we have a massive small animal library and small animal content, large animal, technician, leadership, practice management, nutrition webinars, and more. So definitely check out our webinar archives. But webinars are not the only way we provide CE or education in our multimedia approach. We have podcasts, blogs, videos, rounds, 
and a lot more. So definitely, if this is your first Vecril experience, A, I hope you enjoy it, but B, I hope you check out our website to learn about more of our CE offerings and how we uh, discuss those. I also hope that if you're a Vecril member or maybe you want to be a Vecril member, you check out our discussion boards, our forum. It's a great way to ask case questions, get support, chat with colleagues, job postings, you name it. It's a private community for our Vecril members so we can connect especially during these crazy covid times right connect with others see how they're handling covid see how they're seeing cases again get case consults and just interact let us know how you're doing obviously we hope you're inter interacting with us on social media this is a youtube live social media event we're also on facebook twitter linkedin instagram you name it we hope you interact with us whatever social media platform you are on it's a great way to learn about our upcoming sessions we post cool x-rays funny memes cool stuff just interact with us on social media now this is super important and we'll repeat this multiple times during the presentation this is live this is interactive and this is race approved how do you get your ce certificate here's how to do that on your screen you have two options one is a qr code if you and i'll do it myself as i'm talking to you right now open up your phone application point your camera to the qr code you can see my screen right now at the top it comes up with a safari okay you can do this on android you can do this on the iphone if you click that Safari because it recognizes it as a QR code. The Vecril form comes up for you to fill that out. Let us know you want race approved CE. If you don't have a smartphone, one of the newer Android or iPhone devices within the past couple of years, Justine will put it into the comments. Also right on the screen, tinyurl.com, that URL, that whole URL and that bullet point, copy and paste that into your browser, that same exact form comes up. Filling out that form, ensures you will get your CE certificate. We will keep this form open until 10.30 p.m. Eastern tonight, one hour after the webinar, giving you an opportunity to make sure you get race approved CE. After 10.30 p.m. Eastern, the form will close and we'll provide that to race for CE approval. So please make sure you either use that QR code or use that URL anytime in the next two hours between now and 10.30 p.m. Eastern. And on subsequent slides, we'll include both the URL and the QR code for you to use. One final housekeeping related to this platform. This is on YouTube. Look at that arrow. Many of you, if you're watching the YouTube screen, it's a smaller window. If you wanna make the screen the entire full screen of your computer, bottom right-hand corner is a little almost square, not the rectangle next to it, the icon all the way to the right, okay? Make sure you click on that. It'll become full screen for you so you can see everything wide and in full screen, however big your monitor is, away you go. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button too. That way you hear about our future ones because we're gonna be having a few more free YouTube live events. So definitely uh, hit that subscribe button while you're making it bigger. Absolutely. With that said, I know you love me and myself and Justine, but that's why not, you're not here for that tonight. You are here for our esteemed speaker, Dr. Freeman. Dr. Freeman, first of all, thank you so much. Again, as I said before, I had the, the benefit, the pleasure of seeing your presentation before, and I want to thank you for all the time and effort you put into creating this and, and being part of the Vecro platform, because uh, I think our, our audience will be uh, amazingly surprised, happy, and, and uh, uh, excited about your content. So if you could give our audience, I know you said you're, you're in Texas right now, but a little bit of a background of sort of who you are, or what you're doing right now, and then please take it away. I'm gonna mute myself and Justine. We're gonna remove myself from the screen, and the floor is gonna be yours. Justine and I will be behind the scenes. One final comment, if you have questions, type them into the question screener. Justine or myself may get to some during the presentation, and we'll do as many out loud to Dr. Freeman after the presentation. So again, Dr. Freeman, thank you. Really appreciate this. I'm gonna take myself and Justine away. Floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Garrett. Um, well, thanks to uh, Vet Girl for inviting me to participate. And uh, I'm really excited about uh, being able to share some uh, cool stuff with you today. And just a little bit about me. Uh, my name is uh, Lynetta Freeman and I'm a diplomate of the American College of Veterinary Surgeons. Uh, my specialty in surgery is minimally invasive surgery, and I also uh, helped with uh, starting the Priority for Paws system at uh, Purdue University. I recently retired, and so I'm spending full time doing this sort of thing and uh, hoping to uh, help uh, 
ease the transition into surgery for some of the folks out there. Uh, just uh, want to give a shout out to uh, my colleagues at Oklahoma State. That's where I trained. Uh, I did my residency at Washington State. I taught for a while at Mississippi State. Uh, I worked for Ethicon uh, in developing their surgical devices for about 15 years and then um, went to Purdue and uh, uh, retired there recently. So um, that's a little bit about me and uh, let's, uh, let's get into the presentation. So uh, tonight we're going to be covering several new techniques. Uh, we're going to be talking about the strangle knot. Uh, we're going to be showing some videos and some uh, talking about how these uh, uh, different techniques are performed. We're doing a strangle knot around a clamp. Uh, we're doing a purse string suture, a finger trap suture. I'm going to demonstrate walking sutures, the slip knot. If we have time, we'll do a hand instrument tie and uh, the Aberdeen knot. So uh, let's, uh, let's uh, have the next slide and uh, get into our first, uh, uh, our first case. Oh, a disclaimer. <laughs> um, the opinions that I'm expressing tonight are my own. They don't represent anything having to do with Ethicon. Okay, next slide. So our first case is the dreaded obese dog spay. Oh, when you get one of these cases presented to your clinic, your heart drops because you're thinking about all the things that can go wrong. So the first thing that you're wanting to do is think about risk versus benefit. Um, when do the risks outweigh the benefit? Well, it might be when it's an elective surgery and the benefit of weight loss prior to surgery might make a procedure a lot easier. When is the benefit greater? Maybe if you have a dog with a pyometra or a mammary tumor where you have to go ahead and do the procedure anyway, and then worry about the weight loss after the case. So um, in any case, we have to uh, take care in uh, an obese animal because the tissue is very friable. It's a lot more vascular, uh, or it seems so, and uh, you have problems, issues with uh, impaired visual, visualization due to a thick body wall. And bleeding or oozing is just always a problem in these cases. So um, we're going to talk about a few things that will help us along the way. If you have the capability to uh, consider laparoscopic surgery as an alternative, it is a good alternative and the reason is is because generally it involves the use of an energy source and it's just generally uh, unless it's a pyometra of course it's just generally an ovarectomy and so um, it can be a really great alternative to give good visualization and good hemostasis but assuming that you're going to be going ahead with an open surgery there's several things that you need to think about in order to be prepared to do this case the first one would be to avoid estrus if possible. It's not always possible, but anytime an animal is in estrus, there's generally more bleeding. The next thing is make sure that you do a wide clip and prep. And uh, the reason is, is because things happen during these cases and you want to be prepared to open and perform an exploration if you need to. So let's just take care of the wide clip and prep from the beginning so that you don't have to stop midstream and extend your prep. You want to make sure that you practice good sterile technique with gowns and gloves and large drapes and be really uh, particular about that. A lot of times these cases will take longer and so you will want to make sure that you have um, the capability of giving uh, uh, perioperative antibiotics uh, 30 minutes before and 90 minutes into a procedure. I like to have close anesthetic monitoring for every case, but in these cases, especially you want to establish an IV and have fluids running during the case. And then you want to have access to large clamps like large uh, Rochester Carmalts. And ideally, you'd like to have access to electrosurgery, especially for bleeding in the subcutaneous tissue. And then finally, if you can have an assistant scrub in to help you, that is a tremendous uh, benefit during some of the maneuvers in an obese dog spay. So um, 
I know that most of you will have performed a spay. And so what I'm going to do in this next uh, in this next discussion is just talk a little bit about some of the different techniques that you can do during an obese dog spay that makes th that make things easier. First thing is incision placement. You want to make your incision a little bit uh, more cranial and you want to make it a little bit longer. There's nothing worse than having uh, brought up your uterus and ovary and not be able to exteriorize the ovary because of all the adipose tissue around the ovary. So make your incision large enough so that you can get that ovary out. And then be sure that you practice gentle tissue handling so that you don't um, make holes in the uh, broad ligament that start to bleed and, um, and that um, you have gentle... Um, uh, tissue handling techniques so that the wound heals well and so on. The next thing is after you've brought the uh, uterus up and uh, you're dealing with the decision whether to cut or strum the suspensory ligament, I prefer cutting. And uh, there's a really cool maneuver that you can do to exteriorize the ovary. So once you have the ovary in your right hand, put caudal tension on it and allow it to uh, pop up. And when you have the ovary positioned properly, you will see a little red rim of meaty tissue in the opening to the ovarian bursa. And then you want to trace right off of that uh, cranial end of that little piece of red tissue and you will find the suspensory ligament. Then if you can get the ovary in your left hand, you can use your ring finger to, to broaden out the suspensory ligament, uh, sorry, the suspensory ligament, and try to identify a window between the suspensory ligament and the ovarian pedicle. When you can do that, then you can safely cut the suspensory ligament. After you have the suspensory ligament cut, then you're going to make a hole in the broad ligament, and then you're going to be faced with a decision to use one versus two versus three clamps. I prefer the three clamp technique, especially in large dogs, because I like having two clamps proximal to the ovary and one distal to prevent back bleeding from the uh, uterine artery. Next decision is whether you cut the ovarian pedicle before or after ligation. Some schools teach cutting it before because it makes it much, much easier to place your sutures around the ovarian pedicle. I personally am a bit of a pessimist as far as worrying about things that can go wrong. So I prefer to cut after ligation and I make my sutures pass through the window that I create in the broad ligament. And then um, some schools teach the use of a transfixation suture. The transfixation suture is placed to prevent the ligature from slipping off of the pedicle. And so um, if you make your sutures tight and in a path of tissue that's crushed by the clamp, generally you won't have problems with the sutures slipping off. And I have seen one technique that Dr. Eric Davis teaches for um, uh, stallion castrations where he actually ties a strangle knot first and then he transfixes the suture. I think that that's a, a great technique to uh, to consider if you're concerned about the potential for the suture slipping off the end. And then one versus two ligatures. Again, I'm a pessimist, so I usually do two ligatures. All you need is one tight one, but again, I like to put on two because I just feel more comfortable with leaving that in, in, uh, in the animal. And then finally, the release of the ligated pedicle. Well, it, sometimes the pedicle is under a lot of tension. So when you hold on to it with your thumb forceps, it can slip out of your thumb forceps and go diving into the deep abdominal cavity. And so what I like to do sometimes, uh, and especially I teach this with students, is to place a, a hemostatic forcep on the little pedicle, leave it on there, Go and ligate your broad ligament and then come back and release it. But you want to really take care to make sure that there's absolutely no bleeding before you drop the pedicle. Okay, well now let's just talk about ligating the ovarian pedicle. So you need to pick a suture. You want a suture that's strong, one that ties securely, 
for a big dog, especially an obese dog, you're going to be probably talking about size O or 2O. I prefer an absorbable suture and a synthetic monofilament such as PDS or monocryl or a coated braided suture like uh, Vicryl. So that when you tie them down, you can pull them securely. You don't have to worry about the tissue cutting through tissue, uh, the suture cutting through tissue, and you can get the suture really tight. Next slide. So my choice for ligating the ovarian pedicle, the broad ligament, and the uterine body is the strangle knot. The strangle knot is a constrictor knot that involves two passes around the tissue. It's relatively easy to tie and it's secure. It stays tight even if the, when the ends are manipulated a little bit. And then as we, you'll see in a second, we can also tie it around a clamp. And there have been several studies that have shown that the strangle knot is a very secure ligature on an ovarian pedicure or on uh, uh, any, any type of tissue. Um, next, we're going to show a video that shows the strangle knot being tied. <clears throat> so um, what, what we're going to do is we're going to, uh, uh, let's back up one uh, slide and look at the uh, uh, strangle knot video. That one, yeah. Okay, so first thing we're going to do is we're going to set up uh, a um, model for tying the knot, and then we're going to show you how to tie it. And Garrett's going to play the video and the audio uh, from his end. So hang on, here we go. Yet you will have received a suturing pad and a couple strands of suture. So go ahead and take your suture out of the packages and we will use one strand to uh, create the uh, setup for the strangle knots that we're going to be tying and then we'll use the other later in the demonstration. So start out by, uh, we're going to start by just uh, making a structure that we can tie to and uh, here we're just going to try to make a replica of what it would be like if we were going to ligate an ovarian pedicle. So we're going to leave this suture just kind of loose here, uh, set it up in the model so that we have something that we can tie around. You could also use a piece of IV tubing or uh, another structure, a piece of yarn as well. It's just that um, for the purposes of demonstration today, we're setting this up. So we're just going to tie a, a loose stitch and then we'll have a structure to tie around. The vertical orientation is for the ovarian pedicle. A horizontal orientation would be for something that would represent the uterine body. So the strangle knot begins with a length of suture extending out from your left thumb and index finger probably about an inch. Then the needle holder is passed through a window in the broad ligament behind the ovarian pedicle and the suture is fed through. We make an X on our index finger and then let go of the suture. We take the needle holder behind the ovarian pedicle again, wrap it around again, this time making sure we come up to the left of the previously placed suture. And then we take our needle holder through the space that was created by our index finger, grab the end of the suture, and pull it tight. To conserve suture, most of the pulling is done with your left hand. If you don't care about conserving suture, then you can pull equal tension with both hands. And then we do a series of throws, half hitches, to complete a knot and cut the suture. Another benefit is, am I unmuted now? Okay, another uh, benefit is that you can tie a strangle knot around a clamp. So let's go to the next slide and just look at that for a second and then we'll show you. So, so basically tying a strangle knot around a clamp is a really smooth technique for tying around a tissue that's already been transected. 
It can be used with any size clamp and it uh, works especially well for broad ligament ligation. But you could also use the one clamp technique for ovarian pedicle ligation and try your strangle knot around the clamp and slide it off onto the ovarian pedicle. My favorite place to use it is for deep ligation when operating space is limited. So basically, if you had a, a bleeding vessel down in the, in the deep in the body cavity, you could go down, grasp the vessel uh, with a Carmalt forcet, for example, tie your strangle knot around the clamp and then slide it off onto that deep vessel. Let's go ahead and play a video showing how to do a strangle knot around a clamp. In this video, we're going to demonstrate trying a strangle knot around a clamp. Here we have our structure that we set up before, and we're going to place a uh, hemostat on it. This would be like if uh, you had a vessel that was bleeding down inside the abdominal cavity and you needed to grab hold of it, but you didn't want to tie a ligature down inside. So tying it around the clamp outside the body is really advantageous because it allows you precise control. One of the things you have to be a little careful about is not to put a lot of upward tension on the clamp once you're doing it. So we take the end of the suture, free end of suture in our needle holder, and we wrap it around the clamp from top to bottom. And then we wrap it over our index finger and around the clamp again, coming up to, to the left of our previously placed suture. Then we grab the tip of the suture and pull it through, but we don't tighten it down yet. We leave the loop big and we slide it off of the end of the clamp onto the structure that we need to ligate. And you can see how you can actually position the uh, strangle knot where you would like to ligate it. And then when you have it in the location you want, you finish tightening it and then apply some additional throws to secure the knot and cut the suture about two to three millimeters long. Let's show that again. So here we have the suture extending from our index finger, grasp in the needle holder, taken around the back of the clamp from top to bottom, around the clamp again, over our index finger, take the needle holder through, the space occupied by our index finger, slide it off the end of the clamp, and tighten it. And here I'm doing a series of hand instrument ties in order to be able to better control the tip of the suture. So after we've achieved those ties, then we cut the suture. The next step is to make sure that we examine the pedicle before we let it go into the abdomen. Okay, <clears throat> so as I uh, mentioned in the video, the, the last step is making sure that we uh, have he absolute hemostasis before closure. So you want to do a thorough inspection for bleeding. Look in the left gutter, the right gutter, and around the bladder for any evidence of blood clots or free fluid in the abdominal cavity. In my experience, when you see some bleeding, it's usually located on the caudal side of one of the ovarian pedicles where the broad ligament was torn. To access it, what you do is find the broad ligament and trace it cranially to the ovarian pedicle. And then when you're comfortable that the field is dry, you can proceed with closure. Next slide. <clears throat> Okay, our next case is a case where a gastrostomy tube was placed. And this is a rather special case in that Angel is a nine-year-old standard poodle that was presented with a GDV. And uh, I'm showing a picture from the, uh, from the surgical site there of the stomach after it was rotated. 
you can see that the majority of the stomach is, is almost black and that it is not very thick and that it looks like it's not going to make it. This was a case where uh, resection would have been too major in order to allow the uh, uh, dog to survive that procedure. And so I actually called the clients from the operating room and told them about the severity of this case. And the owners did decline euthanasia. They wanted to do everything possible to save Angel. And so in this case, I knew that the inter internal uh, mucosa of the uh, stomach was going to slough after the case. And I knew that we would need to provide some way to get all of that material that was sloughing out of the stomach so that um, hopefully it could uh, uh, repopulate and she could live. And so uh, we went ahead with the case. Um, and in this case, we actually placed a gastrostomy tube so that we could feed her if possible, so that we could lavage the stomach and so that we could, if she lived, uh, possibly have a means of a permanent gastropexy. Next slide. So the procedure that we did involved placing a purse string suture around a tube that was inserted through the body wall and into the stomach. Uh, you see a purse string suture is a, a in and out suture that's placed in the, in the Picture on the left is shown around a piece of intestine, but it can be placed around the, the rectum, for example. Uh, it can be placed around tubes where you're concerned about leakage. And so the, the picture on the right shows what it would look like when the tube is through the body wall and into the stomach. We take full thickness bites in the stomach every two to three millimeters. I like to use a size two or three O monofilament absorbable suture. And in this case, we used a 24 French uh, Foley catheter placed through the body wall and into the center of the purse string suture. Next slide. So uh, this is the demonstration of a purse string suture technique being performed uh, on a piece of cloth. And it just gives you an idea about how to plan and execute your purse string suture. Hi, all. It's Garrett. I'm just going to restart that video. I don't believe there was sound on there. I picked up on that. So I'm going to restart that video right now so you get the whole thing with sound. Stay tuned.
Here we'll be demonstrating a purse string suture. I have a, a circle marked with uh, some dots around the outside. Uh, this is the diameter approximately of a, a Foley gastrostomy tube, or it could also perhaps rec uh, represent the rectum. And you notice how we're just taking a series of uh, bites that are roughly parallel to the structure that we're tying around. We try to do them as evenly spaced as possible and of the appropriate depth so that it engages tissue but that they don't pull out. We, try, we have to change our uh, direction of the needle holder quite a few times during this procedure. And it helps if you are comfortable in palming your instrument so that uh, the release and the engagement of the needle in the needle holder is smooth. And the last bite is going to be placed here. And then we're going to pull this down. Now I'm demonstrating this procedure with 206, but it actually works better if uh, you're able to use a monofilament suture tie a surgeon's throw so that once it ties down it'll stay and notice how once that purse string is suture is tied the tissue on the outside is brought up closer to the center and this is the idea behind sewing a purse string suture around a tube in the stomach so that it would not leak and then finally if you were placing this in a rectum you would want to place the sutures a little longer and attach something so that you won't forget to remove them. Okay, so that's the first step of the gastropexy procedure. The next step involves sewing the stomach wall to the body wall. And this, again, is done in a continuous pattern from the body wall to the stomach. I generally uh, will select a size 2.0 monofilament suture like PDS or even proline if you want a permanent suture. You take each bite and you leave this, a distance between the stomach and body wall when you're first starting out. So the back wall first and then come all the way around and bring a uh, and then pull on both ends and that will bring the stomach and body wall into apposition. After that, after the, the uh, stomach is sewn and, and pulled to the body wall, then inflate the bulb with a Foley catheter. You don't want to do it before because it's possible that you could um, cause a, a puncture of the Foley and that would be a bad day. Next slide. Okay, then the final step of the gastropexy uh, is uh, to place some additional simple interrupted sutures to really reinforce. Again, I'm a belts and suspenders kind of surgeon, so I would place multiple. Uh, you can see that in uh, Angel's case, after the stomach was derotated and some time was allowed to pass, the tissue itself is looking a little bit better, but still not good. The cross section uh, shown on the left shows the, the position of the stomach with the Foley, with the balloon inflated, and uh, then on the outside of the body wall, a finger trap suture is used to secure the tube to the body wall. The reason a lot of surgeons don't place these uh, gastrostomy tubes is because of the risk of dislodgement. And when the tube becomes dislodged, then there can be the potential for leakage inside the abdominal cavity. And that is why this technique was abandoned in favor of some of the other techniques that are used for gastropexy in GDV cases. Next slide. So here we have a picture of a finger trap suture having been performed on the outside of the body. And um, to do a finger trap suture, you're going to select a very strong uh, monofilament suture, such as number one nylon. And you're going to use a one hand or two hand tie method and tie it tight enough to indent the tubing, but not so tight as to occlude it. Um, this particular picture is showing 
Um, three passes around the tube. I prefer to actually do a minimum of four passes around the tube. Next slide. There are many different variants of the finger trap suture in the veterinary literature. And one of the recent articles in veterinary surgery goes over this with this diagram. One of the most secure methods involves tying the surgeon's knot on one side of the tubing and crisscrossing it on the other side of the tube. And again, as I mentioned, a minimum of four repeats should be used. However, um, the video that I'm gonna show you will demonstrate a, a simple square knot on one side and crisscross on the other. Let's go ahead and play that video. This video is being performed with a size uh, 2.0 suture. So for the finger trap suture, we need to review hand ties. So the first thing to remember is if the suture attached to the needle is in your right hand and you're right handed, then it's most appropriate to do a one handed tie. And I'm here, I'm using a combination of the finger move and the rollover move in order to achieve a one handed tie. And again, that's with the needle attached to the suture in your right hand. If the needle attached to the suture is in your left hand, then you're going to want to do two-handed ties. It's a combination of crossing over your index finger for the first move and making an L with your thumb and index finger with your, for the second move. Again, that's with the needle in your left hand. So going a little bit further and demonstrating it with suture here, I'm sewing from top to bottom or towards myself. And now the needle and needle holder are in my right hand. We'll approximately center the suture and then we'll make a series of hand ties. The first Throw is the finger move with the left hand, then the rollover move. The finger move, and then the rollover move. And notice that all the time the needle is staying in my right hand. Now if we were to do a suture uh, away from us so that the needle exits opposite the wound, Then our needle is going to be in our left hand. And in this case, we would do two-handed ties. Crossing over your index finger, then doing the L move for the second throw. Crossing over the index finger, and then the L move. Next, I want to demonstrate how to do these attaching a tube such as for an esophagostomy, pharyngostomy, or even a chest tube. So you'll start out by securing the skin at the tube exit site. Notice that we're approximately in the middle of the suture, that my needle is in my right hand, and that we did a couple of throws here to secure it. I've got a clamp waiting down the tube, but the needle is in my right hand. So the first move is the finger move. And you want to get it really tight to indent the tubing. Second move is the rollover. Third finger, fourth rollover. Now each of these strands are crossed on the back side of the tubing. And that notice this time my needle is in my left hand. And so now we're going to do a series of two hand ties. Uh, I'm just pointing out here that the needle is crossed behind the tubing. So cross over the index finger, tie it tight, do the L move, index finger cross, and then the L move. 
And now we're going to cross the strands behind the tubing, making an X on the back of the tubing. And now my needle is in my left hand, but in this case, to keep it flat, I have to start with the L move and alternate it with the finger move. Now we'll cross behind again, and now the needle is in my right hand, but in order to keep it flat, it's necessary to do the rollover move first. Again, this is uh, doing it with a one hand handed tie. After approximately four throws are complete, then you want to reload your needle in the needle holder and then make one final pass through the skin to secure the tube finally. And again, the needle is in my right hand, so I'm doing a series of one-handed ties. Finger move, rollover move. Now all these ties could be tied with the uh, instrument, but I think it's much easier and better to tie it with the hand ties. The most common mistake that I see uh, folks make is forgetting to center the suture, uh, center the first throw in the middle of your suture. Okay, well what happened with Angel? So for five days after surgery, we, we removed large quantities of black mucus from the stomach. And she be miraculously began eating on day six. Uh, she went home on day seven. We took the tube and sutures out on day 14. And to my knowledge, there was no recurrence of gastric dilatation. So it just is a case that I uh, want to show and encourage you to um, uh, not be afraid to uh, to uh, go the length with these cases where there's questionable tissue vitality, but be conservative and try to stack the odds in your favor uh, for recovery. Okay, next case. The next case is to demonstrate a technique for walking sutures. And this involves my dog, a seven-year-old Labrador uh, retriever named Sweet Pea. She had a very large uh, three centimeter mast cell tumor on her left lateral thorax. There was no lymph node involvement and uh, uh, it was a grade one. And so surgical excision was recommended. Now you guys all know what happens when you operate on the veterinarian's dog, everything goes wrong, right? Uh, well, that one didn't happen so much with sweet pea, but it was a great case to demonstrate walking sutures. Next slide. So um, for a mast cell tumor excision, the surgical recommendation at that time was three centimeter margins and one fascial plane deep. Uh, today, the recommended margin size is still being debated, but there was a recent review in BMC Veterinary Research of four articles, and this review suggested that two centimeter wide and one fascial plane deep is adequate for grade one and two tumors less than four centimeters and that um, this study showed that there was a low risk of incomplete excision or local recurrence. So next slide. What we wanted to do was a wide excision technique. Really, really important to wide, wide, wide clip and prep. So if you tack down the skin around the tumor to the underlying subcutaneous tissue, this will help keep the skin from moving around while you're doing the, the uh, uh, excision. And you want to plan a fusiform incision three times as long as it is wide. So you start out by drawing a circle around the tumor, measuring the margins, which in this case were two centimeters around. So two centimeters plus two centimeters plus three centimeters is seven centimeters. Seven times three is 21. So our fusiform incision is going to be 21 centimeters long. Um, we try to make an angle of 30 degrees at the corners of the fusiform section so that we can avoid dog ears. 
So this is a really large excision and uh, it takes some special care to be able to get that closed. Not so much on the lateral thorax, but in other areas in the tissue, in the body. So I wanna show you this technique because I think you'll find it helpful. Next slide. You wanna begin your incision and complete it to the one fascial plane depth, but don't be surprised when the defect is much larger than the tissue that you took out because the skin around it retracts. Um, and then once you get the tissue out, be sure and mark your excised tissue so that uh, pathology can tell if there's any close margins. The two pictures shown on this slide demonstrate the excision of a scar, piece of scar tissue that was irregularly shaped. And you can see the defect that was removed, but the resulting defect that was present. And it shows the use of walking sutures. So I wanna show you how they did that. Let's next slide. So we undermine the cutaneous trunchi muscle um, and you wanna uh, uh, undermine using Metz and Mom scissors and try to avoid uh, any cutting any perforating vessels. And so you wanna have a generous area undermined underneath the skin flap that's gonna remain. Next slide. And then you're gonna close by taking a bite of the fascia and a bite of the dermis and pulling the dermis closer to the center of the incision. And with progressive walking sutures like this, you will be able to move the skin more towards the center of the, the um, wound. It also helps to distribute tension to the area around the wound and alleviates tension on the incision line. What you will end up doing is making several large, uh, several staggered rows of interrupted sutures. You want to make sure that you have feel the needle penetrate the dermis and then place the suture closer uh, through the fascia closer to the center of the wound. And you can see in this illustration how that A and B got longer as the suture was tied uh, down. So, an uh, uh, this is the picture from that uh, scar excision case showing how a, a walking stitch has been placed in the dermis and then closer to the center. And several, several, several walking sutures were placed to pull that tissue in and close this defect. The critical thing that you need to know how to do to tie a, a, to do a walking suture is how to tie a slip knot. Next slide. So you have options for surgeon throws, slip knots, or cruciate stitches, but the slip knot is really handy to know how to do. You perform this uh, uh, knot with an absorbable monofilament suture, and, I, and for a dermis, I usually like size 3O, probably PDS or monocryl. Uh, next video. This video will demonstrate how to tie a slip knot using monofilament suture. We begin in the normal fashion by taking a bite in, on each side of the wound. The slip knot is especially good for wounds that may be under a bit of tension where uh, a single throw of a square knot will not hold. So we begin with our needle holder in between the long and short end of the suture tightening it down and you can see how this wound is under tension and it wants to untie. So then we go ahead and make the second throw as if we were going to tie a square knot. And you can see the circle here. If we applied equal tension to both ends of the suture, that would form a square knot. However, what we're going to do is apply more tension, upward tension, to the needle holder and that will allow the slip knot to form and it can be slid down then with the left index finger. And then equal tension is applied to both ends of the suture to get it to convert back to a square, square knot, and then additional throws are placed to secure the suture finally. After about four or five throws then the suture can be cut and it holds the wound in apposition. Let's see that again. So what we're gonna do 
is we're going to place another stitch again in the tissue on each side of the wound. We're going to place a needle holder between the long and short end of the suture and wrap it once. Then wrap it going back the opposite way as if we were going to tie a square knot. Then apply upward tension with these end that's in the needle holder and you can see that uh, how we pulled quite a bit of suture out uh, with a needle holder. And then we apply even tension and finish with a series of throws. And then finally, the ends are cut short. All of the knots that, <clears throat> that we have been uh, demonstrating this evening are available in the Ethicon knot tying book. And I recommend that uh, hand ties and everything as a resource that you can uh, uh, actually download uh, if you just uh, Google Ethicon Knot Tying Manual. There is a new version out, but um, I don't know how widely it's being distributed at this point. Hopefully soon we'll see it. So this, uh, these are just two slides to demonstrate the outcome of that large scar excision. Um, and um, you can see how that the uh, wound tension was distributed and that the dead space was obliterated. Next slide. Caveats for walking suture, uh, they work best in animals with thicker dermis like dogs. You wanna make sure that you don't penetrate the epidermis. If you do get a good bite of the dermis, the skin's gonna look dimpled, but it will flatten out in a few days. Don't use too many sutures because it could interfere with the blood supply, and for that reason, we don't use them in flaps. And folks, don't recommend using them in contaminated wounds because it could lead to pockets that that would be uh, result in an abscess. And finally, when you're tying slip knots, expect to use a lot of suture. Next case, uh, next slide. Uh, well, let's skip this one and go on to uh, our Aberdeen knot. So um, in Sweet Pea's case, the subcutaneous tissue was uh, closed and, and uh, the knot was ended with an Aberdeen knot. The Aberdeen knot is also known as a chain stitch, and it's most useful for ending subcutaneous or intradermal closures. There have been studies that show that it's just as secure as uh, tying back to a loop, and it's much easier and results in a lot less bulky knot with only one cut end left. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna end with a loop of suture, you're gonna go through the loop and pull the suture that's attached to the needle underneath the, the loop and tighten it down. Do that several times and then pa finally pass the needle through the, the loop. Let's show that in the next video. The Aberdeen knot is a good knot to use to end a continuous suture pattern in the subcutaneous tissue or dermis. Here I'm going to demonstrate the use of an Aberdeen knot uh, as if it were in subcutaneous tissue. So I'm just tying a regular square knot here to begin the pattern. And then I'll do three or four bites and end with an Aberdeen knot. The Aberdeen knot has proven to be just as secure as other knots that are traditionally used, and it has the advantage of only leaving one cut end of suture. Another advantage of the Aberdeen knot is that you can use it to close the subcutaneous tissue and then continue with your needle back and close the dermis and end that with an Aberdeen knot as well. So here we're just placing a series of continuous sutures uh, so that we'll have a little running start in order to do our Aber Aberdeen knot. So on the next suture, we'll use our 
loop and leave it loose as we're creating it. Now it's really important to make sure that your suture is to the right of your um, ending suture and that it is not twisted. So you go through and you grab the suture. The left hand just basically holds tension on the suture and the right hand does all the work. Uh, just snugging that loop down then doing a series of about three or four loops through the standing loop. Each one being pulled down tight, primarily with the right hand, but also the left hand helps to hold tension. And then finally, the suture attached to the needle is brought through and pulled tight and cut. And you, can, and you can see how you can sew the subcutaneous tissue in one direction, tie an Aberdeen knot, and then use the same needle and strand to sew back in the other direction, uh, the dermis. So uh, let's follow up on Sweet Pea. Well, sadly, Sweet Pea didn't get walking sutures, and she developed a very large seroma in the post-operative period. Um, a Jackson Pratt drain was placed, uh, but it occluded and the seroma reoccurred. Uh, we took out the drain, put in an old fashioned Penrose drain and covered it with a bandage and the seroma resolved and the, uh, the drain was removed after about five days. Uh, excision was complete and there was no recurrence. Next slide. So uh, today we've gone over a lot of stuff Strangle knot, strangle knot around a clamp, a purse string suture, a finger trap, walking sutures, slip knot, a little bit about hand instrument ties, and the Aberdeen knot. Now, all of these videos are going to be posted uh, separately with the uh, presentation as it gets posted on YouTube uh, after this presentation. So you'll have an opportunity to go back and refer to those and use your suture blocks and the suture that Ethicon provided to, um, uh, to learn how to do all of these knots. They're all very helpful, and the cases that I've uh, <clears throat> presented today just demonstrate how these can be applied in different types of cases. And now I think we would be open for questions. That was fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, we have a bunch of positive response, a bunch of people on here. Um, I just wanted to also uh, thank all of you guys for attending. I know it's late depending on where you are. Everyone's practicing right now. Um, if you don't mind just typing in the chat or even in the comment section below, um, a shout out to um, Dr. Freeman and also to Ethicon. I know they'll really appreciate that. We'll make sure to pass it on. Um, couple of questions. Is a strangle knot the same thing as the modified Miller's knot? Uh, I used to think it was, but no, it's not. <laughs> uh, they, they are different. And uh, Dan Smeek has done a great job in describing each one of the knots and the benefits and the uh, done some studies showing different levels of knot security with each of the knots. The strangle knot is the, the one. It's the easiest to tie. It's the easiest to teach. It's the easiest to do. And it's the most secure. So do the strangle knot. Excellent. And um, do you mind just briefly talking about when you were talking about the purse string suturing before, we use this all the time in a specialty emergency clinic, especially for E-tubes or for suturing in urinary catheter tubes. Should we be using a taper point or what type of needle should we be using there? So um, when you're placing your purse string sutures, it's probably best to use a cutting needle for uh, skin. Um, if you were um, doing a purse string suture in soft tissue, for example, in the stomach that I presented, it's probably better to use taper. 
Okay, great. Now, before we uh, get into too many more questions, I just wanted to reiterate, please type in your comments, any feedback that you guys have. A huge shout out for Ethicon for mailing people, Suture Kits or Suture. Um, we do apologize if you didn't get it, but we opened it up to the first 500 and Ethicon was amazing and mailed it out to the first thousand. So um, again, check out the uh, links that you see in the chat section. You can purchase this for $9.99. It's totally worth the investment. Make your boss buy it. Um, and to be quite honest, you can practice on chicken skin, chicken breast, obviously wash your hands. But um, And I'm just going to reiterate, uh, when in doubt, I promise the skill set will come with practice. So even though we really stress about it, it's going to come with practice. But the more you practice, the better you are. Don't forget, if you need CE for this, please fill out the Google the uh, Google Documents link that is pinned to the top in that tiny URL right at the very top of the chat. Um, that link is only going to be open for 55 more minutes. So after you're done with this, go over there, fill out the information. That way we can email you your CE certificate. If you don't have a license number, or unfortunately, if you're from Hawaii or Vermont, um, unfortunately, race left out those states, but no problem. Just email us separately. We will hook you up and we'll fix that for you. So just type that in and shoot Garrett and myself an email. A um, couple other questions that we see, or Garrett, if you see anything, let me know too. Um, do you mind just describing again what, um, when learning finger ties, what the roll over or the L move it refers to. <laughs> <laughs> That's my terminology. And uh, I, I uh, developed it because I really took the Ethicon knot tying manual uh, down and I photocopied every page and I made my hands do exactly what was shown in the picture. And I had a hard time communicating with students what, what you need your fingers to do or your hands to do. And so I developed the terminology for the finger move and the rollover move to demonstrate what was happening with those knots. So um, that's, that's really my, my way of trying to explain what's going on. Great, fantastic. Uh, Garrett, do you see any other questions? Or? I'm scrolling and scrolling, but uh, the reason oh, it's taking so long you. is because it's all fantastic <laughs> feedback for Dr. Freeman. It's like comment after comment thanking Dr. Freeman and, Doc, and, and Ethicon for, for, for doing this. And I mean, it's like hundreds of thank yous. So how do I get through all of those to find a, find a simple question is the problem. I, I do see one. Um, when do you use a surgeon's knot instead of a slip knot if tension is high? Why? why why wouldn't you use a surgeon's knot? Well, sometimes you use a surgeon's knot and it unties. And so I, my go-to is usually a try a simple throw, a tie a surgeon's throw, and then I tie a slip knot. And uh, just from experience, I know when tissue is under a lot of tension, you really need a slip knot. Great. All right, thank you so much. I know that everyone, there's fantastic feedback in there. Um, again, just wanted to give a shout out uh, to Dr. Freeman for taking the time to do this. All of you guys, I know you guys are all really busy. You're probably all Zoomed out, especially if you're in vet school. Remember, this is on YouTube, so it's totally free. So please make sure to tell your colleagues, um, or if you see them suturing and you're like, eh, you, you need to watch this YouTube video because you don't know how to suture. <laughs> Always feel free to refer that back. And again, if we ever get to vet conferences again, please make sure to stop by Ethicon and give them a shout out for uh, just being able to sponsor this. We really appreciate it. Again, thank you for all that you guys do and hang in there. I know it's a, a tough year. Um, don't just forget to pull out that. Yeah, just yep, keep practicing. Just keep on practicing. Exactly. So important. Make sure to fill out that tiny URL you see pinned at the top for your CE. Um, again, that link will close in 55 minutes. So you have one hour to do it. This is, the CE is only available for people attending live. Okay. So if you're watching this later, fantastic. You should be learning and practicing. Um, but CE is, again, only associated for those people who watch it live. And with that, we hope everyone has a wonderful night. Garrett, any last comments to leave no, people with? No, I, I just wanted to thank everyone. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm blown away by the amount of positive feedback, shout outs. Thank you for our speaker and our sponsor. And, you know, we certainly hope to do more events. Maybe, uh, maybe we can get a, a, a round two.
of uh, the, the neck the next series of uh, suture and, and surgery tips because uh, trust me from somebody who they don't allow to walk around with a scalpel for a variety of reasons I can tell you there are many people like me that somehow start a hand tie and end up suturing their sleeves together so we need this we yes. need this so thank you so much really appreciate it yeah Here I see some great thank great you. comments uh, for all Thank of you, everyone work behind the scenes and getting those videos to play and everything. I really appreciate it. <laughs> no worries. They were well done and uh, well received, certainly with our with our comments. And with that said, I uh, want to thank everyone for joining. Hopefully you have a great rest of your evening, depending on where you are. Tomorrow is Friday, so we'll enjoy Friday and the weekend if you have one. And stay safe. And uh, as Justine normally says, wash your filthy hands, right? Let's get <laughs> through this. We'll mask up, wash our filthy hands, and uh, we'll hopefully see you at our next event.